identified four victims and plan on more than just the four murder charges filed today. talk about a very famous serial killer um oh. and and this one's actually surprise surprise not in california i know i've picked a lot of california cases but okay. this this one's going to come from the windy city in chicago um Chi -town. wait Chi -town. south side or north side uh this is south side of course mm -hmm. <laughs> chirac chirac uh, yeah uh this this guy is pretty damn famous uh he's inspired a bunch of movies um okay. you know um have you heard of the killer clown I have actually. I, I don't know the story, but I have heard of it. Yeah, this is what he's, uh, you know, because he's been in famous paintings. People have painted him. He's he's done paintings himself from prison. Mm. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and um, his stuff is sold for a lot of money. And uh, part of his persona was being a clown in the neighborhood. And I'll mm. get I'll get to that. <clears throat> and it's none other than the one, the only, unfortunately, John Wayne Gacy. Okay. John, lot of, Wayne, John Wayne Casey. Casey. Gacy. G A C Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this guy was born on March 17th, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. His uh father was a uh, a veteran from World War 1. Mm, um yeah, he was a machinist working in downtown Chicago while his mother stayed home to take care of him and his two sisters. Uh Okay. His father never really took care of him or the family um, in, you know, the, a loving way. He provided for them, but he had severe, again, back in World War II times, World War, uh, World War I times, um, all the way up until basically we've even talked about times or stories that involved guys coming back from Vietnam. Uh, hmm. their, their mental health was never really taken into question. It's like, here, take a pill, whatever, get over it, you know? Um, this <laughs> the good old days, huh? Oh, yeah, the good old days, yeah. <laughs> just drink this tonic or whatever. So um, he had PTSD? He sure did. The father had PTSD. And um, in, if you think about it, a lot of people think of World War II as the bloodiest world war of all time. It hmm. actually was uh, World War I. Um, if, really? you, if you watched any of those movies... They would hunker down, build trenches, and then all of a sudden someone would say, charge. They'd all run into machine gun fire, and they'd be mowed down like nothing. So the loss of life was tremendous, more than World War II. Even though everyone thinks of the Holocaust, they think mm -hmm. of all the, you know, the, the different countries fighting at the same time. There was mm -hmm. a, it was actually more bloodshed and more loss of life in World War I. Just imagine you standing in a bunker, and the next thing you know, boom. You, your your life is gone just like that. Yeah, exactly. Or in the trenches, like you <clears throat> said. Yeah, I mean, and then there back then too. There was uh, there was no rules to war. Basically, uh, it was mm -hmm. all honor system. I mean, they used mustard gas. People, you know, all kinds of stuff. We could we could spend a whole podcast on that. Sure could. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he would uh, he would often come home from work at the machine shop and go straight to the basement and start drinking. Um, the father? The father, yeah. Um, the family dreaded this fact because when he would return from the basement, he would return with a game that the family would just, out of frustration and, and, and fear, would, would, would basically wonder, which one is he going to take his anger out on? And it was either his two sisters, his mom, but for the most part, he took out his rage on John Jr., which is John Wayne Gacy. Mm. Um, Senior would play cruel uh, games with him with a belt, smack him in the head um, more than more than his sisters. Uh, he would uh, make fun of him uh, because John was a little short, a uh, little short kid, portly, little fat. You know, mm. um, he basically would. Uh, would would lock him in a closet, not let him out for for uh, periods of time, and this was not helping him grow either because he did have a bit of a heart condition too. So when he did get a chance to go outside and play, he couldn't play very long. He had shortness of breath, everything else like that. Yeah, <clears throat> and um, so he would um, his father would sometimes would have violent mood swings, take swings at him, and uh, you know, 
So he he was taking a licking before he was like fifteen or whatever. He was just, Lord. yeah. Um, but at the age of eleven, what do you? What happens with serial killers? What what is one of the things that happens that can alter their mindset? What are the things that they do that no. makes them? Yeah, or, or usually what's one of the traits or what's something that happens to a serial killer before they're a serial killer at a yeah, young you age? <laughs> yeah, see, Gabby got it right away. <laughs> I was about to say they kill an animal or something. <laughs> well, yeah, the killing the animal, that's one of the things too. And uh, obviously pee in the bed, stuff like that. But mm-hmm. no, she she nailed it. Uh, young John was on a, on a swing, swinging too high, and probably was like, "Look at me, I can go real high." And, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> he, he went real high and and flew off the swing, and he landed right on his head. Ooh, yeah. And um, <laughs> he would he would uh, develop a blood clot in his head. And Ooh. the problem with this is he would have frequent blackouts when he would do any kind of exercising. Mm-hmm. So his father thought, okay, you're blacking out when I tell you to do chores, when I'm having, you know, mowing the lawn, stuff like that, physical stuff. You're blacking out at school when they want you to, to get physical activity. Father says, you know what? I know we'll stop those blackouts. Let me hit him in the, in the head some more. Let me, oh, let, me wow. let me push him around because my son is just lazy. He's just come up with excuses. Mm. <laughs> Welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, he he took beatings for his blood clot, basically. That's jacked up. Yeah, and and they wouldn't diagnose him with a blood clot till five years later, till he was sixteen. Oh crap! So he had blackouts for over five years. <clears throat> um, John Junior was always uh, looking for the acceptance of his father, so that's even worse. So this, here's a guy that's just continually beating you down, you know, even taking shots at you. Like he would call him gay feminine uh, a girl he would he would make fun of his man boobs and say oh, look, look at those you know tees or breasts you know and just and laugh at him i mean that come on that's terrible right yeah no yeah that definitely uh can cause some psychological problems at a young age and also insecurity yep yep yeah you're making him hate the world already and he's not doing anything wrong and this is a kid that's trying to get the acceptance of someone who's taking these shots at him. So it's one thing to call him gay and all this other stuff and, and, and a female and a queen and all the, the names you could think of back then in the, four, in the, well, that would be the 50s, late 50s or whatever. But he's doing that in front of his friends when he's actually outside too. Oh, that's jacked up. Yeah. <clears throat> Ooh. Yeah. And so this would play a huge part in the story ahead this name calling him, putting him down, him trying to get his dad's approval. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I will say about his dad and it's going to sound wrong, but he, I guess had the feelings for a reason because John in, in actuality had gay tendencies and was feeling an attraction towards other boys. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that was part of it. Um, Okay. Okay. But John respected his father so much, and get this, and, and, and liking men in the 50s was not easy to do because of, yeah, because, I mean, you could be thrown in jail, you know, at, at, you know mm-hmm. for that kind of activity. It which, was a lot different back then. It wasn't, oh, yeah. That movement was very, yeah, it wasn't out there like that. Back then. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. So um, he would, uh, you know, he would actually try to, force himself to like girls because he did not want to disappoint his dad. Wow. So, yeah. Um, but despite all this, he could not take in, in, in junior in high school. He could not take the abuse anymore at home. Couldn't stand to see his sisters get beat himself, get beat. Um, his mom takes shots from the dad. Um, the, the father threw a, um, what was it called? A, one of those glass pitchers. And hit his mom in the head, shattered all over her head, Ooh, cut her like open. face. Yeah, yeah. So he he was like, you know what, I'm out. And um, he hitched a ride on a train, and he went west, and he made it to Las Vegas from Chicago. Oh wow! Yeah, from Chicago. I mean, um, that's a not that's a not bad place to go. Well, I don't know if it's Vegas was back as as bad as it was back then. Vegas always been bad. Well, there we got. Well, there we have it. 
<laughs> well, let, let's all right. Let's see if you guys can get this one. He went to Vegas. He found a profession and a job. Now, it's uh, it's got to do with death, and or you know, what what job do you think he got out there? Not a mortician. Yeah, I was about to say a mortician. Yeah, that was too easy. My bad. I gave it away, but you guys got it. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he was the undertaker. <laughs> yeah, well, he was he was uh, actually a custodian at a mortuary. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. But okay. but you being be a- Huh? I wouldn't mind being a custodian at a mortuary. Yeah, but let's just see if you do what this custodian at the mortuary did. Let's see. Okay, if- let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, let's see if this would appeal you at all. The poor- this is a twist. <laughs> this is a twist. So <laughs> So he- John didn't have anywhere else to to sleep. He lied on his resume, gave a false address. He um, lied about his age, said he was 21. He looked 21. He looked older, portly kid. Um, they believed him. And, uh, well, he had the keys being the custodian to the place, however, you know. Mm-hmm. So he had nowhere to sleep. Oh, and, crap. Uh, and so he had, he had been watching The Undertaker with the bodies, day after day as he's mopping the floors, cleaning stuff up or whatever, using the embalming fluids, even watching a few autopsies. Wow. So he's watching that. He's getting fascinated by the dead bodies and stuff. Um, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Now, here's where I don't think Matt would do what Mr. John Wayne Gacy did. Let's hear it. (laughs) He figured, well, you know, sleeping in the office is kind of boring. Um what if I jump into a casket with one of the dead bodies and sleep with it? Yep. Yeah. What? <laughs> you lost <Yeah>. my attention. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Heck no, man. That's creepy. Very much, right? Oh, um, this morbid curiosity that he uh, wound up getting the courage to do, jumping in these caskets and sleeping with a dead body, would really feel this fire later on. It really would. What? Yeah. Um, but despite this, he gets, he gets, uh, acquainted with the Vegas area, goes back to high school over there, finishes up his high schooling. And he, a year later comes back to Chicago with help from his, his father. Uh, he gets enrolled in Northwest community college and he okay. gets, he gets a business degree. So as weird as this guy has had a childhood and through high school, the undertaker stuff and all this, just all of a sudden he's flipped the switch and he's wanting to, you know, move forward. I mean, he's, he's, he gets a job at a shoe factory and within a year and a half, he becomes a supervisor and hmm. he's starting to help out with the, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, the business aspect, like the, the the owners of the company are like, hey, you know, would you help, like to help us with the books and stuff like that? And this is where he meets Mary Myers, which would become his first wife uh, in 1964. Mary Myers. Mary Myers, yeah. And they're moving up the ranks in the community um, because they joined this club in the Chicago area called the JCs. It's called the junior – they're called the JCs in, in – um, what do you call it uh, in short because it stands for chamber of commerce local chapter of chicago mm-hmm. and um they basically watch over the neighborhoods you know they're the ones that say oh you know this street deserves you know um uh this street needs street sweeping or you can only park here so many hours or or hey there should be a st- uh, red light at this street or you know they look out for the community and, and how to better it and stuff like that and it's sort of like a social light mm-hmm. um you know, people that need to feel better about themselves, but you know, they're the annoying ones. You know what I mean? They'll write a note in your car. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're two feet off the curb. You know what I mean? Like park <laughs> closer. <laughs> people like that. I got you. The good it, Samaritans. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, annoying Samaritans, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's in this part of the JCs that's in a chapter of Springfield, Illinois. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, uh, John liked to drink a lot, and there was a lot of members that liked to drink a lot as well. And mm-hmm. uh, here's another twist. Okay, now Uh-oh. we know that he's married to Mary Myers at this time, and you know he's moved up the ranks. He's you know he, like I said, he's a supervisor slash working with a business in the shoe factory. 
he, he now here's where something just it it it, it flips a switch on him. Remember, he's he seems to just flip a switch. Like he can go good. He can he can focus on something. And right now he's focused on just being the best husband he can be, working with these socialites, moving up in the Chicago ranks. This flipped another switch. Okay. Can you guys, can you guys guess what uh, someone asked him at one of these uh, parties? Somebody asked him, "Is he gay?" Gabby. I'm going to say nobody asked him directly. I'm going to say some guy hit on him and asked him for sex, probably. Bingo! <laughs> you guys are both Wait, in the same... Right? You guys are both in the same park, but she she was more right. She was more right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the guy didn't really ask him if he was gay, but, but he might as well have, but he just... He asked him to uh, perform oral sex on him. Just randomly well, as they were drunk. Well, there we have it. And John did, and he seemed to like it, and he said later on it awoken a beast in him as far as his feelings wow. towards men. Okay. So, so wow. okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. So because of who he was in the community and because of his father, because of the narrative back in the day about being openly gay or even being gay or going to bathhouses, John was living a lie to himself, and he was – having a hard time dealing with his sexuality um because he's so, married with a woman yeah, by now right exactly yeah. so blocking out his inner feelings this entire time um with with the sexual experience with that guy um he would he would actually begin to um uh what is it he, he would experience instead of having these normal uh, gay experiences would turn out to uh, he he wanted to he would have these dreams of having gay experiences, but bondage like it, it wouldn't just be a normal like relationship. That that one act gave him thoughts of doing you know having pain inflicted on him, having control and oh. and, and and inflicting pain on other people. BDMs. Yes, yes, very much so. Um. So in 1965, here's another twist. Um, the father-in-law, you know, Mary's father, owned a chain of Kentucky Fried Chickens, and he <laughs> okay. he, he knew you that. Got my attention. You know, geez, <laughs> I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> <laughs> you got a black man's attention now. <laughs> oh jeez. <sighs> <laughs> See where do I go from here? Um, <laughs> so so John had had all that experience with business and and doing good sales with uh, the um, shoe factory. So his father in law said, "Hey, you know what? I need someone to help run these these uh, KFCs." And and John's like, "Hey, it's in the Chicago area. I can just go from one place to another." And um, he's like, "Sure." <laughs> he he took the job, and so he got a big pay raise. And then his wife gave uh, birth to their first daughter. He'd have two. Uh, in actuality, oh, wow. um, he he was a different kind of father. Though as they grew up, <clears throat> he never ra- raised a hand on them because of what his father did. He did not want to unleash something else in him and get abusive with his uh, his his daughter. So that was the only good trait mm. he had right there. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, but then another twist in the story. We have multiple twists. Here we go. Another um, twist. Yeah. This man would begin to live a double life, though, being John Jr., John Wayne Gacy. Um, the JCs had a dark secret. Now, they were your, your typical American family, supposedly, by day. And at night, when they'd have these parties, these parties would turn into wild wife-swapping parties. Um, if they had new recruits, it would turn into like, hey, you know what? Let's have an orgy. So it was like <laughs> we're we're a Christians wow. by day, and we're we're uh, what is it called a uh, Sodom and Gomorrah at night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wait, so his wife was a part of that too. Yes, yes. What? Wow. Yeah they they were they were uh, they were even Wait, brought, was this the era, was this the sixties? This was late sixties or uh, c- coming into the early seventies. Yes, yes. About the hippies area. <clears throat> oh yeah, yeah. Lo- you know, love was free back then. Remember, you could just free love. 
you could you could bang with no consequence, and then all of a sudden you, you have uh, the clap, or you have all these uh, you have gonorrhea, and then you're like, how did I get that? Well, maybe I was I shouldn't have slept <laughs> fifteen people that one night. <laughs> you know? Maybe all oh, the sixties and seventies, <laughs> exactly. I mean, come on, if you if you've seen any of those videos of freaking uh, what was that called the um, the Summer of Love tour? What was that one? The uh, Woodstock. I mean, people, yeah, yeah, people were having that. people were having muddy sex. That is just man, dude. Yeah, <laughs> that all is, that. That is so disgusting. <sighs> That's another story for another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could we could what's it called? Uh, branch off so many different ways if we want to. <laughs> um. So they so they were was, having orgies. Yeah, they were having orgies. They they would even in, invite prostitutes. And then all of a sudden you had what? you had drugs and heavy heavy drinking, so wow. And John began to become what? the ringleader of these parties, so oh wow. So at night he was so okay you know, okay so so inside he's gay right. Mm-hmm. However, he's still with a woman, and he's also performing <laughs> sex with women. And I'm quite sure at those parties he was performing gay stuff too. I'm quite sure. So yeah. it sounds like he's bi. Yeah, at this point or he's bi. He... He's bi because yeah, okay. he's he's totally like just playing into it. And um, obviously, mm-hmm. at, when you're in an orgy, those type of parties, I guess well, whoever's closest to you is whoever's. <laughs> I mean, it sounds bad, but <laughs> I mean that's just what how how those go. I guess you know. I'm, yeah, what's that skit with Dave Chappelle? Oh, you come here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, that's gross. That's gross. It is gross, but I mean, that's that's uh, people back in the day. You know, what I mean, that, that's yeah, what this yeah, guy yeah. was doing, and so yeah, he's doing that those sexual orgies at night, but during the day, he's a well dressed manager of five different KFCs. And as he goes to every one of these, wow. K- as he goes to every one of these KFCs, he's asking the employees to refer to him as the Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> All I could think was Peter Griffin, the Colonel. <laughs> yeah, the Colonel. <laughs> so I could, I could be no manager at no KFC, man. I, there would be no chicken left. I'm saying it. <laughs> Yeah, and you'd be like, "Hey, I gotta test this before we send this out." I gotta test it, man. We gotta test it. I want a breast and a thigh. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh! Are we talking about the party? Or are we talking about the food here? Casey? We talking about the chicken? <laughs> okay, just making sure. Making sure. Oh man! So he was well dressed and was referred to as the Colonel. Mm-hmm. Every time he stepped into KFC, they could not call him John. Could not call him Mister Gacy. It's the Colonel, Sir John, Sir John, <laughs> Colonel John, <laughs> Colonel John, <laughs> <laughs> and this is not even the South either. This is this is Chicago. So this is the Chi Town. Okay. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> so in 1967, he would run in. He would have his first run in with a law. Um, okay, he lured a fellow member of the J.C. Sons into the basement at one of the club's hangout. Now, this wasn't one of the club's usual crazy sex thing. It was like a family get-together, but mm-hmm. it's like in one of those big cl- uh, like uh, buildings where they have recreational like a recreational hall. And it, mm-hmm. had a, it had a basement, and he lured one of the, the teenagers in there, and he said, hey, man, you know, let's, let's have some drinks. I'll let you drink. You know, your father's cool. Me and him are cool. You know, I'll, I'll give you some drinks. So he gets the kid a little liquored up, and then um, he forced the boy to to uh, perform oral sex. And uh, afterwards, he mm. threatened him with beatings or telling everybody what he did to out the kid. And um, the kid vowed to stay quiet. <clears throat> but then other members' sons were being violated the same way with promise of alcohol and partying mm. and smoking weed. And Gacy would, for, uh, would force them to have sex with him or – perform sexual acts on other boys so whoa yeah so he was living out his fantasy with with the little boys yeah with and with teenagers he didn't he didn't like them uh well, he, well, yeah not little boys but teenagers yeah he didn't like them any younger than i think 13 or so like he 
Like he liked him over the age of 13 towards 17. He didn't like him over 18. That's all. still disgusting. That's still, it's very, yeah, it's very disgusting. Grown. Yeah, it's very disgusting. I'm just saying that yeah. that was his age range, you know. Um, so, again, he threatened these kids and, you know, not to speak up to their parents. And he actually got away with it for a couple months. Um, but that first 15-year-old would wind up telling his parents and they would report John. And he was placed under arrest and uh, he got out on bail uh, to uh, face the kid in court. Uh, two weeks later, the case would be finalized and John will be found guilty of sexual assault and rape of a minor. And he was sentenced mm. to 10 years in prison in 1968. Wow. Yeah. So, um, Sexual assault and rape? Yes. Wow. Beca- because he forced, even though he didn't rape mm. him like anally, he still forced him to have oral sex with him. So they, they, they actually threw the book at him back then. You know, that's pretty pretty big. Yeah, back then, that's pretty steep. Yep, yep. So because of this... I'm going to guess he didn't serve his entire time. <laughs> <laughs> you're already ahead of the schedule, but yes, you are you are right. Because <laughs> uh, easily we could say right there, hey, you know what? Story over, right? You know, like mm-hmm. he got his justice. And uh, he'll learn from his mistakes and never do it again. That's a fairy tale story, but I seem it seems like it's not going to happen that way, right, Todd? Right, because that never happens on this uh, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they usually get a break, and that break always spins off into the worst way. And uh, uh, but he did lose his wife at this time, and she took her two daughters. And um, because of this, in 1968, he would never ever see his wife or two daughters ever again. She uh, seriously? Yeah, he would never see him again. So the moment he was, the moment he was put in jail, he lost his clout in the community. Everyone looked down upon him, and uh, and you know everything that he built up, you know the KFCs being the colonel, that's all gone. <clears throat> it's all gone. Wow. So he had nothing. He had nothing. So he's in he's in prison. And uh, well, yeah, that's expected to lose it all. Yeah. yeah. But see, here's the thing, though, and like Gabby alluded to. This would only take one year because in 1969, uh, a year into his imprisonment, <laughs> he became a model citizen, and he was working. Oh, wow. He was working in the kitchen. I don't know if he was telling the uh, other prisoners, "Hey, call me the Colonel when I serve you the food." <laughs> <laughs> but um, he got into various social clubs, even a Bible club, and uh, he became very friendly with the uh, guards in prison. Interesting. So, yeah, so he used his good social skills while being incarcerated. And um, here's another twist in the story. So remember his father okay. and everything? Mm-hmm. Um, in 1970, his father passed away of a heart attack. And um, so he, he lived a pretty long life, you know. And um, he figured that he didn't die of a heart attack, but he died of the shame of his son being possibly gay and in prison for what he was in prison for. Mm. So John did not take this very lightly. He was, he sobbed and sobbed for a long time. And, um, after a tough time, he continued to press on though with the parole, you know, trying to get paroled. <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if it's possible for someone to apply for parole this many times in 18 months, but he he applied and got uh, parole hearings three times in in only 18 months. <clears throat> wow. wow! Yeah, and he got his 10 year sentence, uh, in which the judge um, sentenced him. He got it released. He got himself released in late 1971. Wow! Are you serious? So he served three years. Yeah. Well, he was what? in court. Like yeah. two and a half? Two and a half, yeah. Yeah, two and a half. That was it. Wow, that's not cool. Not at all. So oh. so interesting. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's here's another twist here. It says in late nineteen seventy one in the township of Nor Park, Chicago, uh John purchased a house which would become super, super infamous. Uh, after this, um, on eighty two fifteen Somerdale Road in uh, in Chicago, North Park, Chicago, um, he would quickly shack up with uh, and become engaged to a one time friend from high school, Sharon Hoff, 
who also had two daughters and he moved them into the house with him. Um, okay. Yeah. So out of why jail, did, I wonder why he got engaged to a woman. If everybody already knew he was gay, it was a cover up. Yeah. I, Matt's correct on that. It was a complete cover up. He, he was trying to be psychological and reinvent himself and being gay would not be a good start to him in that time period. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so out of jail, he established himself in that new neighborhood with a new soon to be wife and with, you know, his two, I guess, step kids or soon to be step kids. And, um, John started to use his people skills, his use of tools to start a small little contracting business, which he became so good with his people skills and hiring people, the right people to work for him. Business was booming. Like he couldn't, he, I mean, he went from making birdhouses to, to, uh, you know, doing brick, uh, brick, uh, walls, iron fences, uh, room, ex you know, remodeling houses, uh, room extensions, whatever. Right. The, the, the mm -hmm. point is he was making good money. He was playing by the rules and his reputation went through the roof. Um, mm. I so, wonder how he started so good coming out of prison. Like, what do you have? I don't think he has nothing. How do you so buy I, a house and all that? I mean, maybe he had good pay from the KFC stuff. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't really specify how he was able to turn it around that fast. But he yeah, obviously maybe his father. I don't know if he got anything from his father, to be honest with you, because his, his father was just like a general laborer in in, in a freaking mm -hmm. you know uh, sh you know factory. So, um. I, I don't know. I, I couldn't find nothing on how he was able to just turn. What ethnicity around. is he, Todd? He is white. <laughs> so maybe he used a lot of charges on that white <laughs> privilege card. I don't know. <laughs> He's like, sir, your white privilege card is up to the limit. And said, my money is good. You are right, sir. Here's $1,000. Hey, man, I don't know. <laughs> this house is mine. Yes, sir, it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me check the, your skin tone. Oh, okay, you're approved. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? That could have been. We're joking about it. it. Could've that could have been. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Um, so he's he's actually making money hand over fist, where he's getting a lot more employees. Uh, the community is beginning to trust him and say, "Hey, if you need something done, go to PDM Construction. It's John's company. You know, they do just about everything." So people were, it was word of mouth, man. It was just taken off. Um, Dang. The thing is, most of his employees were under the age of 20. And a lot of them, Ooh. a lot of them went to That's high school. That's not going to turn out good. <clears throat> yeah. And so people, a lot of them what time? A lot of them were still in high school. And so, Ooh. yeah. So, so people were like, wait a minute, you have a good company. You are getting surprisingly good work from these teenagers and young adults, and they're all guys or boys. Uh, why are you hiring them so young? And his thing, his automatic excuse was, well, you know, if I get them older and more experienced, I'd have to pay them more. And this way, you know, I'm making more money, and they're getting their first job and a lot of experience. Wink, wink. And everyone's like, you know, John, you're a great guy. You know, you're helping these kids out. I <laughs> if he didn't have a record, he got a point. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if we had the internet back then, people would be like, you know what? I still don't believe this John guy. Let me look up his criminal. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, hmm. yeah. Never give a drunkard a smell of boy, uh, wine. I don't think that was all true. <laughs> He well, was which, living out of fantasy. That's what it was. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was probably saying, you know what? You guys are uh, building that fence pretty fast there. You might want to slow down and take off your shirts. It's really <laughs> hot out there today. <laughs> bend over a little bit. You <laughs> dropped something. <laughs> yeah. Don't bend with your knees. Bend with your back. Bend straight over. <laughs> I know it's messed up, but still, I mean, that's probably part of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was big. Well, then, uh, he, you know, okay, so at this moment, if he could just control his sexual deviancies in his or his thoughts of doing bad stuff, if he could just control himself, he's got a booming business. Yes, he's hired yeah. these kids, yeah. 
maybe it could just be eye candy and he could just get over it. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. But no, no. Uh, Gacy could not control himself. Um, he would start to hit on these kids. And um, oh, yeah. he, he hit on a, a teenager that um, did not take too kindly to his advances, and he got his ass kicked because of it. Oh. Yeah, John John got beat up. And uh, a couple others quit the job because, well, he was probably trying to pat him on the butt, uh, you know, talk about how good they look in jeans and stuff like that. I mean, mm-hmm. very, very inappropriate stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, uh, the the guys would go, the, the kids or boys would go and either tell their parents or they would tell the police. And, um, again, he did. Yeah, he gave the same, like, explanation was, hey, man, these guys are just, you know, I'm just trying to be cool with them. I'm trying to help them with, you know, the money that they're making for my job and the experience is going to help them in life later. And they're able to give back to their parents. Ask them how they're able to, you know, to to, how their sons are are pitching in to, to the rent and to the food. That's because of me. You know, I'm doing a good thing for these boys. I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach them how to be a hard worker. And the police are mm-hmm. all, the police were all, all right. And so they let, <laughs> just let him walk right out. You know, like, okay. They wouldn't look into him. They didn't look into him. They did not do their homework at all. They were like, oh, Johnson, wow. what do you think? I think he's, this is a good, uh, good role model. I think so too. Carry on, sir. Wow. Yeah. That was it. I mean, they, they 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 let him all those accusations. I mean, come on. The old saying is, "If there's smoke, there's a fire." Right? If there's smoke, there's fire. There was hella smoke everywhere, mm-hmm. and they they just didn't find the fire or didn't care to find the fire. So, wow. again, this is one of those opportunities where if the police did their job, then they could have avoided a lot. Oh, <laughs> so much, so much, Gabby. So much could have been avoided, and this will come up later in the story too. Mm. Um, so, <clears throat> and because of this monster not being stopped, we have a date to talk about. Uh oh! And you know what that means on this show? When there's a date, there's what? <laughs> exactly, someone dies. And we're not uh, talking about romantic dates. Yes, yes. Um, it's January second, to be exact, nineteen seventy-two. This would start a flood of things to to come. Um, a young boy by the name of uh, Timothy McCoy was 16 years old. Um, he had just <laughs> missed his transfer from the Greyhound station, and the next bus would not arrive for 10 hours to take him out of Chicago. Ooh. Yeah. So this is a, a humid, or this is a cold night in January in Chicago. And this kid's got basically, he's got the options of sleeping on a bench in a cold Greyhound station waiting 10 more hours for another bus to come. Or John Wayne Gacy, who just happened to be pulling through the Greyhound parking lot looking for a a male prostitute, happened to see the young boy on the bench. And uh, he came over there and said, hey, uh, what's going on? And uh, young Timothy told him his situation. And uh, he's, John's like, hey, you know what? <clears throat> I got an idea. Instead of just staying right here, he goes, uh, I'm, I'm going to be up all night, you know, you know, in, in the evening time. How about uh, we go? I'll, I'll get you something to eat. You know, I was once in your shoes. Uh, I'll, I'll take you out to, to get a bite, show you the town. You ever seen downtown Chicago? And the boy's like, uh, no, not really. I'm just passing through. He's like, come on. There's a lot of cool mm-hmm. places to see. Let's go. So do you think John stays true to his word? Of course not. Of course not. He shows them something else. Actually, he does stay true to his word. Get out. Follow me on this one. Follow me on this one. So right. <laughs> he shows them the downtown area. He shows mm-hmm. them the hot spots of Chicago. He even drives through you know where I think I think they said Wrigley Field or something like that. He takes him into some nice areas, and then it's a couple hours, and he says, "You know what? Um, if you want to come by my house uh, and just take a nap before we, uh, I could take you in the morning to the Greyhound station. You will be right on time. Everything will be okay." And the boy agrees. 
because he's like, hey, man, this guy's gotten me dinner. Um, we've hung out. I've seen a lot of cool spots. Um, yeah, why not? You know, he doesn't live too far from the Greyhound station. Why not? Mm. The problem is John's <laughs> girlfriend or soon-to-be wife and two daughters are out of town. So John's got the house to himself. Mm. And here is the story. Now, we don't know, and the, and the police still to this day have no idea what transpired other than this is what John's account is because obviously young Timothy loses his life. But okay. here's what John claims happened. <clears throat> John's account goes like this. He was sleeping in his bed and on, and then it was January 3rd, the next morning, John wakes up startled because Timothy's standing over him with a knife and John got up, tackled Timothy to the ground the two began to struggle back and forth where he grabbed the knife and started stabbing the kid in the chest multiple times, killing him. Mm. John then said he went to the kitchen to clean up only to see the table set for two and breakfast on the table with coffee. So John realized, Oh my God, he was making breakfast for me and him to say, thank you. And he just happened to have the knife in his hands, and he thought because of the lighting in the room or what have you that he was trying to attack him. So John said he felt, quote, unquote, bad. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so what does someone do in an accident like this? What do you think John did realizing now that this kid just wanted to make breakfast in thanks to him, but he killed him? If, if it was genuinely an accident and he felt that way, I would have called the police and told him the story of what happened. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, John... What Matt said. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know what? You know what? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So what happened? Just a little insider. Just yeah, a little, little inside insider. joke. If you've been following the last few episodes, I think we've been doing one of those every we, episode. We ain't got to do one of <laughs> uh, Okay, but we're not laughing at what happened. We're laughing at an inside joke. So don't it's don't don't kill us in the comments because no. some some of yeah, you guys yeah. get way too sensitive. Yeah. Um. So what happens is John decides. You know what? What Gabby said, Matt said, would be the thing to do. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to instead wrap the body up in sheets and then plastic. Then I'm going to remove the door to the uh, basement where the crawl space is. And I'm going to dig some uh, dirt out where the foundation is. And I'm going to stick his body upright under my house. What? Whoa, what? Yeah, that's where he, that's where he buries the first body. Like between the wall? Like... Okay, so picture like underneath the house there's like it's not a f it's not a finished crawl space like you know underneath your house like you know how I don't know if you've ever been under a house it's like mostly dirt and there's pipes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like that. It's a, it's a crawl space no bigger than maybe um uh 3 to 4 feet down and but he digs mm -hmm. a hole to make a path. Then he carves out mm -hmm. like a like a like a little area by the foundation and sticks the body in there. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, so police, after hearing this story years later, they realized most likely he made a sexual advance on the kid and, um, you know, went after him and killed him because he, they felt that didn't make sense. Because even if that were the case and John were to have confronted the kid, the kid at some point would have said, hey, I'm just making you breakfast. I didn't mean to have the knife, you know. Mm-hmm. It takes a while to kill someone stabbing them. You don't die with the first stabbing. And he was stabbed multiple times in the chest. So, Yeah. yeah and if they were wrestling on the floor, at some point the kid's going to say something unless he was deaf, which he wasn't. So, Yeah, agree. Yeah, so, um, so this was his first killing, but they can't confirm that there was any more because there was a two-year absence in between the next murder. So they, they seem to think that there's some bodies out there that we just don't know about yet. Um, but his company began, his company just continued to grow, and he was working 16 hours a day. Um, he wasn't seeing his wife. 
And, you know, at this time he was like, screw it. You know what? I'm done with her. He openly told her, I don't want to sleep in the same bed as you. I'm not attracted to you. You know, um, he basically told her everything uh, without saying he's gay until she found uh, magazines uh, that were por- porn- pornographic and they were showing gay gay scenes and stuff like that to where she's like, oh, I see, I see how it is. And um, she even would see teenagers going into their garage and them shutting the garage door. And uh, so, so Mary was like, you know what? I'm out. So she dipped, and she filed. She for, left. Yeah, she filed for uh, filed for divorce because I guess they had just got married too. They finally had just gotten married within those two years, and uh, she mm. filed for divorce. Took her kids, and uh, you know he was he wasn't uh, attracted to her no more. So in 1975, also on the weekends, he had an obsession, and he came up with a persona of clowns he wanted to entertain children in the community and he came up with yeah he came up and created a clown persona and costume called pogo the clown and wow if you look at the pictures of john wayne gacy as the clown take a look at his makeup and compare that to a normal clown Mm -hmm. and he and he did his makeup especially around his eyes and around his cheekbones and face in more of a a clown type look that you would see from an evil clown posse part of the the Joker's type crew in Batman like it wasn't a, a, your normal like kid type clown bright face he did a very sinister looking clown but he was still parading around like he was this innocent big guy clown for the kids very interesting yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll post that on Facebook. I'm about gotta, to say, I, I got to look at that one. Yeah, yeah. And he began to get jobs on the weekends as Pogo, doing birthday parties, kid parties, all kinds of stuff. Wow. So he was a full-on clown. Yeah, he was. Yeah. So he so he's working during the week for the, his construction company, which is still rolling. But when the weekends came, he was Pogo. <laughs> not not Bozo. <laughs> Not Bozo, he's Pogo. <laughs> Pogo the clown. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And um wow. he would learn tricks, various magical tricks that uh would lead to many diabolical things in uh Ooh. that we will find out in part two. Of oh! <laughs> part two <laughs> Of uh, John Wayne Gacy, because this is the setup, man. I'm gonna, I'm lobbing it up there, and then I'm gonna dunk it next week. Y'all come back now, yeah. We got that peach cobbler. 